Uh, so good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, thanks for being here. And Matt, thank you for hosting these sessions. And thank you for your input on topics uh, related to business travel. Prior to this session, I appreciated everyone's comments um, about what you're interested to learn and talk about today. Um, I, um, if I don't cover all the topics you're interested in or you know, I'm not covering them to your satisfaction or you have, I'm sure all of you will have input far beyond what I can offer. And I look forward to learning from you. So please jump in with questions and comments at any time. And once I go into slide presentation mode, I won't, I won't be able to see you or if you're raising your hand. So um, Matt has kindly said that he will uh, monitor the chat function. So, um, so we should be good to go on that. Um, so I'm going to be offering my perspectives on travel um, based on 22 years, very shortly, it'll be 22 years uh, consulting as an evaluator. Um, the first eight of those were through, uh, I, I was an employee of an applied social science research company here in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm based. And the last, I can't believe it, 14 years I've been doing this on my own. Um, initially, very briefly as an independent contractor, and then, but mainly through uh, an LLC. And um, I, I work mainly in the health sector, just so you have a little context, I work mainly in the health sector. I, I do relatively small mixed method evaluation studies and evaluation capacity building work with grant makers, nonprofits, uh, sometimes with local government agencies, coalitions. I've done a, a few projects with international governmental organizations. Um, and I work uh, both domestically and internationally. Most of my travel is to Latin America and the Caribbean. Although like probably like most or all of you, I've been off travel for the past, uh, you know, 15 months approximately, but look forward to to getting back to work travel in a few months. Okay, so I'm going to start, uh, let's see, share my screen. And uh, if I can here, go into presentation mode. Okay, so um, I wanted to start out by mentioning some travel considerations and just wanted to, to point out a disclaimer at the, at the bottom. Um, I'm not trying to offer legal, financial, or medical advice. Uh, I'm not licensed to do that. Um, so please consult with a licensed professional on uh, uh, the details of some of those legal, financial, or medical points. Um, but I did want to mention, um, you know, uh, some major buckets of travel uh, considerations. Um, there are, of course, I think what's in the forefront of many of our minds right now, health and safety concerns. Um, we need to think about costs and costs include our time and our expenses in relationship to what's reimbursable or what's deductible uh, through our taxes. It's important to think about the value of travel for uh, the projects that we're doing and also for business relationships. And um, there are also other travel perks. So, um, and thanks to, to, to Matt for uh, commenting in advance on this first one. Uh, we can accrue uh, miles or points through various kinds of rewards programs. And then I would add that um, Travel for work related travel often affords us the opportunity to also see family and friends and to see sites that we want to see. Um, I will say that I try to leverage every one of my business trips to either see a friend, spend some time with a colleague, uh, see some sites that I wanted to see. You know, maybe I'll pick a, a, a museum that has an, an exhibit I'm really interested in. Uh, so I think there are a lot of different considerations. Um, let me just ask the group, uh, are there other big buckets of considerations uh, in travel that you would want to mention? Um, I usually try to see if I can parlay it into a family vacation. <laughs> so if I have to go somewhere for work, yes. how, can I arrange it that my husband and kids can come with? Great, great. 
absolutely. I have done that as well <laughs> with my husband. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I just want to go through some of these topics. Um, and I don't want to, uh, of course, we've. Oh, curious, so Julia, uh, we also yeah. have a comment that uh, Robin Taylor likes to make sure she sees multiple clients at a time. So she'll see them by from guessing what she means that she will. That if she says multiple clients together, meaning she would go and see multiple clients in one big, in one big trip. So she can kind of probably limit the amount of time she's on the road and, and maximize her costs or max, maximize the use of her expenses. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes um, related to that, sometimes what I'll do is actually negotiate with my clients that they will split the travel costs. Um, and, you know, they'll agree like, gee, I'm going to be going on a trip to see two clients. They each will, will reimburse for half the airfare. Uh, they're happy because they're spending less money. And I'm happy because I can, as you just said, and Robin, thanks for that comment. I can make just one trip and, you know, be able to see both of them. Great. Um, so I don't want to dwell on health and safety <laughs> threats, because I think we've all been thinking about that. But of course, some of our considerations are, you know, COVID, um, other communicable diseases, situations of civil unrest, uh, which I would add can come up very suddenly. It happened to me, actually, my, my uh, gosh, my last work trip, end of 2019, what I was uh, stuck in Cali, Colombia, because of a civil unrest situation, a curfew, a lot of violence, couldn't go to the airport, couldn't get out. So, you know, these kinds of things happen and um, sometimes we can anticipate them and sometimes we can't. So kind of things to think about. And of course, other safety issues as well and planning for them. Um, on my many trips to Latin America over the years, so I've worked in Honduras, um, uh, I've worked in Guatemala, um, Biggest safety issue is uh, ground transportation. So I'm always doing a lot of planning related to ground transportation in advance and kind of having backup plans uh, if there are challenges with ground transportation when I get there. Um, a few points about uh, precautions. So um, CDC offers traveler advice, uh, lots of information about uh, not only vaccinations, that's a big topic, but also other health related points. Um, the US State Department has their uh, STEP program. Uh, I always forget exactly what that stands for. Uh, something about a traveler, the T is traveler, the P is program. Um, I, you can enroll in the program and then when you make international trips, um, you can, um, advise where you're gonna be in the dates. So if there is some kind of emergency while you're there, uh, at least the State Department is aware of you. I will say that in 10 trips to Colombia, I always registered with the State Department. The one time I didn't was the end of 2019 when there was civil unrest and I was stuck, uh, but everything worked out fine. But it is just that kind of extra sense of security and connection you know, to know uh, that you're registered. There are lots of different types of travel insurance covering health issues, um, uh, trip delays, and all kinds of other situations that can arise. Some of you may have suggestions about travel insurance uh, companies that you particularly like or, or don't like. Um, medical evacuation, uh, which is often referred to as medevac with two different spellings. Um, there are memberships. Uh, you can um, enroll in a membership for medical evacuation. Basically, what that means is that if you are uh, anywhere, it can even be in the US, uh, and you have a medical emergency and you need to be uh, evacuated back to the United States, um, they will take care of that. Uh, and then I really rely a lot on advice from uh, clients and colleagues for health and safety issues in particular countries. So for example, uh, years ago traveling to Guatemala and I was trying to, I was doing uh, interviews with different organizations and there were two organizations that were like two blocks apart from each other. And I was like, wow, that's super convenient. I'll meet with one, I'll walk across the town square to the other one and my colleagues, shook their heads and said no. 
we are going to have somebody drive you the two or three blocks in this particular community you just it's it's not safe for you to be seen so um i took their advice and um i really do rely on that kind of advice a lot any comments or suggestions around these kind of health and safety precautions Amy was uh, asking about travel insurance and how you manage travel insurance. I don't know, Amy, if you wanted to follow up and get any more specific to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe then. Um, because I have some clients that require it, some that require it and cover it, and some not at all. And <laughs> it's left to particularly international travel of basically shopping per trip because I, you know, I'm not going to get a blanket one. So I was just you know, wondering if you had any any tips or tricks or others do as well. And I think you meant on the, uh, uh, you were, uh, are implying about registering with the State Department. I always register with the embassy and I don't know if that's included what this step thing, but I'm part of the step to get travel advisories, like if things escalate, because I go into Indonesia and yeah. other places, but I also register with the embassy in country always. Uh, I'll address that second point first. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I don't believe that step registration itself um, then automatically leads to embassy registration. Um, that is not something that I have done, but I do always take the embassy numbers with me. And I would add, I leave an emergency sheet with my husband and it's online. Like I print, I leave a printed copy and it's online where I can access it and where he can access it. It has things like, you know, the embassy, the nearest consulate, my medevac, the phone number and my membership information, like credit cards, like just sort of all the basic stuff and the contact numbers for my colleagues that I'll be seeing in country. And I note like <laughs> who speaks English and who doesn't. And, you know, just so that if something happens and, you know, he's trying to reach me or find me, um, he can. So, but definitely it makes sense to me that especially where there's no, there are known situations of unrest that registering with the embassy could, is, is, sounds like a good idea. On the point about insurance, um, I, uh, I, I let my medevac membership lapse during the pandemic because I literally <laughs> haven't gone more than probably uh, 50, oh no, I went 80 miles to get my first coronavirus vaccine. That's as far as I've been since the pandemic started. Um, but um, yeah, I haven't, I don't commonly get travel, other kinds of travel insurance, um, but um, folks may be able to recommend different companies that they like. Um, I know that TravelX, which does currency exchange, has all kinds of insurance. Um, there are lots of different kinds of policies with like a thousand parameters that you have to set. So I think it is a matter of, you know, deciding what your priorities are for a particular trip and then finding a policy that's going to be a match, you know, for what you're looking for, because there are so many options. It can be pretty time consuming to do that. So I think that if folks have specific recommendations about companies that, you know, have made it easy, especially if you've had to make a claim and a company's really done right by you, um, that would be a great company to suggest because, you know, of course, we don't really worry too much about it until we actually need it. So I'm sorry, I don't have more specific recommendations. I, as I said, I don't get extra travel insurance very often. Thank you. Sure. Maybe someone else may have other specific recommendations. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, in thinking about travel costs, there's the question of time, of your time or your employees or your subcontractors time, and then your expenses. And, um, and I thought um, I would um, mention, uh, you know, some of the, ca the categories of expenses, right? So there's transportation, planes, trains, buses, boats, rental cars, Uber, Lyft, car services, airport shuttles, tuk-tuks. Yes, I've paid for a tuk-tuk. Uh, parking, tolls, gas, mileage, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, lodging, of course, uh, meals. 
Uh, for those who are paid on per diems, which I'll mention shortly, you know, there's this reference to incidentals. And I actually, in preparing for this today, looked up what the heck does incidentals mean? What does that actually mean? And the definition that I found is that it, it, it includes things like tips for luggage porters and room cleaners, um, laundry cleaning and pressing services. So in my experience, clients will not generally reimburse for incidentals. But um, if you are uh, getting coverage for travel costs under a meals and incidentals per diem, which again, I'll say a little bit more about per diem shortly, apparently that that is taken into account in, in determining those, those per diem rates. Um, there can be communication expenses. So for example, when I go abroad, if I'm in Mexico, I spend $5 a day to be able to use my data plan and my calling plan from the US. So in other words, I can call anywhere in Mexico and back to the US without paying anything and use my data plan as if I were in the US. If I'm in Europe, it's $10 a day. Um, so you know there are those communication costs to think about. Um, currency exchange fees, uh, visas and departure taxes, and you know other kinds of payments that you have to make related to in particular international travel. Um, there can be extra medical costs, whether it's getting vaccines or, or um, prophylactics for malaria, for example, uh, and extra insurance. So I just wanted to mention some of those categories because as you're budgeting, you know, sometimes you don't necessarily have in mind all of the, the potential expenses. Um, so any comments about this? Are there other categories of expenses that you've had or that you would expect to have? Mileage and uh, rental car, or well, transportation, would that fit under transportation? Maybe? Yes, yes, absolutely. Mileage, uh, gas, uh, if you have an electric vehicle, if you're using your own electric vehicle, the, the charging fee, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. The one that I always forget until I get to the point of asking for reimbursement is mileage to and from the airport when I'm flying. And I was like, oh, of course, that's one of those ones that, you know, I wouldn't have that cost unless I was actually going, you know. And then, of course, parking yep. at the airport. Absolutely. Parking, uh, parking meters, parking garages, all that kind of stuff. Julie, do you have an, a, a perspective on? Expenses like when you're looking at your meals or your per diem. Um, I was I was struggling with this the other day because the federal government has a first day and last day amount, which is 75% of your of a per diem that they would identify, and they have different per diems for cities. So if you go to Seattle, it's one, and if you go to Mascouda, Illinois, it's you know the basic, it's the lowest rate. Um, but um, and and. And I looked at that and I thought, I don't know how to apply this consistently. So I looked at it just by lunch, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you need those meals, then you just select the meals. And that's how we set up our internal form. But what is your take on first and last day of per diem? Can you can you clarify a little bit what do you mean by what is my take? Like sure. What it, what I mean, do you use do you do you uh, and how do you how do you uh, think about DM that you uh, offer to yourself or that you charge to your clients. So when I'm looking at it as reimbursement for my employees, uh, I was looking at the per DM rates that the federal government publishes yep. through GSA. Yep. And, um, and so I was looking at, at what the different amounts would be for the cities. And I, the way I, I decided to do it was if you're, if you need, if you're gone during breakfast or lunch or dinner, then you would select those and provided it's not being given to you by, you know, uh, the program that you're, you're attending, um, you would you would get that re reimbursement. But in the, in the way that they set it up, there's a first day and last day, meaning you are at home on the first day, so you don't need all of your per diem, and you're at home on the last day, so you don't need all of your per diem. So they only calculate that you get 75% of your per diem, and I'm not sure. I'm gonna use that because if you're gone during breakfast, then you should get breakfast. So if you're home for dinner, or if you're if you're if you're not home before dinner, then you you should get dinner in your per diem, and that's how we, we set it up. And I don't give any any consideration. Yeah. Um. So I will say that um I don't use per diems very much. So I do have one client who, um, we there is an annual meeting, 
and um, everybody who attends, uh, all the project members who attend the annual meeting, uh, we get per diems. Um, I've also worked on a couple of projects with international governmental organizations that also just say, you know, these are the per diems for your meals. Um, with uh, subcontractors, I've actually never had my employees travel yet. Uh, I newly started having employees uh, last year. But with subcontractors, um, my subcontractors have never traveled under a per diem arrangement from a client from a client of mine. So I've always said, you know, I'll reimburse uh, for meals up to the federal per diem per day. And I don't do the first day last day thing. And I agree with you, Matt. And it's certainly happened to me like, gee, my first day of travel is I have to be at the airport at 7am. And it's like midnight by the time I get somewhere. So um, I, I, I much prefer reimbursement for actual expenses up to a reasonable cap. And usually I find the, the federal per diem rates to be pretty reasonable. Um, more broadly on the point about per diems, sometimes there's a challenge where there's a per diem limit for a hotel, um, but there is no hotel within you know, that price range that's available, especially if the client last minute says, hey, can you fly out here in two days? And the hotels are booked. Um, I have found in those circumstances that clients have been flexible and said, you know, gee, this is the only hotel within a reasonable radius that's available. Okay, this is what it costs. We'll cover the whole thing. So just wanted to throw that in there. Does that, Matt, have I addressed your question? Yeah, I think so. And there's a bunch of other questions, but you know what? I think you should continue with the presentation. We'll have plenty of time to chat through these. So as everybody has ideas, continue to put them in the chat and we'll make sure we cover those in, okay. in the chat function and the actual or literal. Okay, chat. great. Um, so in budgeting for travel time, I know this can be a, this can be a challenging. Um, I wanted to provide some examples of what may be covered by clients. And this is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but this is according to my experience. Clients may cover your actual time. Maybe you have to drive an hour and a half each way to get to each in-person meeting and clients agree they'll cover the hour and a half to get there and the hour and a half back. Um, I've sometimes been in a situation where clients have said they'll cover actual time, but only up to a maximum of eight hours uh, per calendar day. So, um, you know, in a travel situation, for example, from San Francisco airport to Bogota, Colombia, sometimes it takes me 20 hours. Um, that may cover two, that may be on uh, two different calendar days, but then, you know, the question is, if I spent uh, 18 hours in one calendar day, um, maybe I'm only gonna be covered for eight of those hours. Um, some consultants um, I know charge for half of their actual time, that's their policy. Um, I commonly, when it's possible, um, charge for time that I couldn't be engaged in other tasks. So I look at it as, for example, if I'm driving to the airport, um, I really can't be engaged in some other task. If I'm waiting in line to check in, if I'm in uh, a line to go through immigration, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I'm waiting for the flight to, to take off, but I can't have my laptop out and, you know, I can't be working on something else. So I make an estimate of the amount of time that I really couldn't be engaged in either other work tasks or other personal tasks that I would reasonably wanna be engaged in. And that's what I charge for. I also wanna add um, if, that there can be different hourly rates for um, remote consulting time, meaning you're consulting from your own office or home or wherever you wanna be, travel time and time in the field. So sometimes it makes sense to budget different rates. Um, and if you have employees, I found this out last year, um, that can be built into the employee, the um, contract, if you will, or agreement that's set up with employees. So I have an employee uh, right now, a part-time hourly employee, and we have agreed on different rates uh, for these different activities. 
And we did this in order to be able to do the work for the client within the available budget. The employee was absolutely willing to do that. Um, just make sure that you're abiding by employment laws in your state or local jurisdiction. And so in, I found out here in California, I worked with an employ, uh, employment attorney, um, what I was legally obliged to do, and that's what we wrote in. So for example, if my employee, if she is on, if she is on travel for 12 hours to get somewhere, I have to pay her for 12 hours, even if the client won't, I'm obliged to do that. And I have to pay her time and a half for, for the hours over eight hours. So that's a simplified version. But the point that I'm making is that if you have employees, it's very important to be aware of the laws that govern what you're paying them and under what circumstances. Another question for budgeting is what happens in the case of travel delays? So I was stuck once for three days because of a massive hurricane on the East Coast. I was stuck on the East Coast paying for a hotel. So what happens in the case of big travel delays. You might have insurance that covers it. It may be that your client will cover it. In that case, I was, I was out of luck because the whole reason I was there through the date of the hurricane was that I'd taken some personal days after the work trip. So it really was not the client's responsibility that I was then stuck in a hotel for three more days. So uh, any comments or questions, Matt, that you wanna take now about budgeting for travel time? Um, we did have a question about good strategies, and I don't know if this is budgeting for travel time, maybe it's not, uh, but good strategies for just maintaining receipts and, and your costs and, and, and how you go about just managing, you know, managing what you, while you're on the road to make sure you're able to uh, reimburse or ask for reimbursement. At the, at okay, the I do have a later slide that just has a few points about reporting, um, but I will say that what I do when I'm on the road, um, I always have this folder. It's like this big plastic accordion folder and it has lots of different sections. And um, I have each project that I'll be working on while I'm on travel, like gets its own section of the folder. So I keep my papers organized. And then I have a section at the back where I stuff all my receipts. So the various receipts that I accumulate before travel, like I you know, pay for my, plane tickets. And um, so I have those already. But while I'm on travel, I'm getting receipts for food expenses or ground transportation or whatever it is. And I stuff them in that back part of the folder and they that's where they all stay. So they're all together, hopefully, <laughs> when I get back. And then I clip all the receipts, um, you know, per trip together and, you know, then go on to deal with um, whatever reimbursement paperwork I need to deal with. Um, so that's kind of a short answer of, you know, how I deal with all the, the pieces of paper, just trying to keep them together, because otherwise they end up, you know, things fall out of your pocket and things get lost. And then you, I always find one receipt like smushed in the bottom of my backpack, like two months later. And I'm like, oh, here's where, here's where this receipt for the train ticket went. Um, so, but I do try to keep them all together and keep track of them. Um, I did, I will say that when I was on an extended international trip to do field work, I had this grand scheme. I brought this portable scanner with me and I was gonna scan everything to the cloud so that just in case all my stuff got stolen or lost, I wouldn't like lose any of my documentation. And I got lazy and I didn't do that. Fortunately, nothing was stolen or lost, but, um, but there are really small portable scanners that, you know, if that's, if that's a concern that you have, um, you can, yeah, absolutely. And now with phones, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm being like outdated because this trip was in 2012 um, before we really had those capabilities. So thank you for bringing me up well, to date. Yeah, Robin and I, are, uh, we had a, a back and forth here that uh, an Andy Rusillo as well, um, if you use Dropbox, you can scan directly to PDF. I do this all the time, particularly just for, you know, contracts and things. I do this all the time. Now. Yes. Um, my aunt needed some help sending something out. She's like, I don't have, I don't have, I have a scanner at home. You can bring it. I was like, I've got a phone, you know, I'll just bring my phone over. We can scan everything go straight to PDF. It's just like, as long as we don't have a massive amount, it's fine. Um, yeah. And then that goes directly to the cloud right there. You, I do that all yeah. the time. Like that's a, another good, good strategy just so that, 
because I, I hate paper. I, I don't even know what to do with it most of the time. And so I just scan it as soon as I can get it if it's important. Definitely. Thank you. That's I appreciate knowing that about uh, scanning directly to PDF in Dropbox. So I, I when I got employees, I upgraded to a Dropbox for business account. So um, that would be a great place to keep to keep stuff. You're going to love it. We've already paid for it. Great. Other comments about uh, budgeting for travel time. Does anybody have any other strategies for budgeting for travel time other than what's listed here? Anything that's worked well or that hasn't worked well? I like the idea of the eight hours a day. I, I that staff will be starting to travel to, you know, all in the United States, but one, one trip will go to Fairbanks, Alaska, and she's going to take some time, but like what's reasonable, and I want to be reasonable with her, um, she's going to be flying on, on Sundays to get there because the programs will be starting on Mondays. And so, you know, I think it makes sense to, to, to uh, how everything's negotiable and we're all reasonable people. So it's just a matter of making, making a policy that makes sense, but a max of eight hours a day makes sense. Unless of course it's just really onerous. You know, I don't know, to see. She's probably going to take a red eye. So, I mean, how do you, how do you coordinate that? I don't know yet. Yeah, I was, I was going to say for travel that if I'm doing plane is to make sure that I have work that I can do that I can legitimately charge to the client or another client. So I'm not wasting my time, but I do have, I do have one that I drive four hours um, away that has been suspended for COVID, but it'll start back up. And I don't have employees, but you raised some interesting points. I was curious if you know, if I was going to allow an employee to go to a conference and travel to the conference takes a certain amount of time, then how do you consider the legal obligations of paying for their time when they're almost kind of volunteering to want to do something too? So it just, it raised some questions, but I don't have employees, so I don't really need to know the answer. Yeah, but I think that's a great question. I mean, I think the issue is, you know, are they going to the conference quote on work time? Um, or is it, you know, so when, when I was an employee, for example, uh, and I traveled to conferences, uh, that time generally wasn't covered. I mean, if traveling to the, to the conference was specifically for a project of the company, and if the client was covering the time, then that was considered work time. Otherwise, it was considered, I'm taking time off to go to this conference because I would like to um, uh, engage in some professional development and maybe the company was paying the fee for the conference. Um, but I think all of that needs to be negotiated with the employee. Okay. Thank you for those comments. Um, so some tips for navigating, um, travel expenses. Um, and I, um, th this is not meant to be a list that should be carried out in the order that the items are numbered here. It's just uh, kind of some uh, tips as they occurred to me. Um, uh, making sure that you really identify the full range of your potential expenses so that you can do that kind of cost benefit analysis that um, someone in the group was referring to earlier. You know, you need to know what or what reasonably anticipate the full range of expenses in order to think about the cost benefit. Um, if you are traveling for a client, it's really important to understand their policies. Various clients of mine, they have sent me like, you know, the 30 page travel policy manual. And I have made myself, um, you know, I've taken the time to read the manual and understand what their policies are and what they reimburse, what they don't reimburse. And if I have a question or I'd like to renegotiate something, I do it starting from a place of saying, I understand that your written policy is X, but how about in this situation? Um, understanding tax implications and payroll requirements. So this is where talking with your bookkeeper, your accountant, uh, you know, uh, if you have an attorney who helps with um, em employment law matters, um, all of that can be helpful um, for you to work out uh, these kinds of things like what's gonna be reimbursed to employees or subcontractors and how, and how is it gonna be coded 
in consistently in your bookkeeping system. It is important to negotiate with your client upfront. So um, you don't want to incur travel expenses, having had no discussion with the client about how those expenses will or will not be covered, and then say, gee, here I am with a bunch of receipts. Can I just turn them into you? So really negotiate upfront. Make sure that everything is put in writing, that you've reached agreement. Um, travel expenses are addressed in all of my contracts with clients and with subcontractors and, and, and with employees. Um, where it's appropriate, use rewards programs. So that means especially accrue points, you know, whether it's airlines or hotels, whatever it is, uh, accrue points as much as you can. And even when a client is paying directly, you can usually get your rewards number uh, in so that even though the client is paying for it, you get the rewards for it. Um, also think about whether you wanna use rewards for your travel. So would you like, let's say you're going to a conference, the cl a cl no client is covering the expense. Um, would you rather spend the money on the airfare and take the deduction or use points? Maybe you can use your mileage points for a personal trip because for a personal trip, you wouldn't be able to take a business deduction. So like keeping all of those different uh, factors in mind can be helpful in deciding how do you wanna best leverage your rewards program, your deduction opportunities, and what can be reimbursed. Make sure you collect your documentation before, during, and, and after travel. So sometimes there are receipts you need that, that don't actually come in until after you're back from travel. Um, and make sure you submit the documentation to your client in a timely way. So some of my clients have a time limit that after travel is completed, all of the documentation has to be submitted for reimbursement within X number of days. So just make sure you don't miss the deadline. Comments or questions? Um, I did want to to the points. Uh, oh, yes. I, you also want to make sure you're working with your staff. To, I mean, I I don't know many people who do this or consulting firms that do this, but sometimes consulting firms don't allow staff to collect their own points and they take them and they keep them to the, mm. the firm. I think it's just a bad strategy um, because your 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 people or yourself you are on the road. And you deserve to get your own points and your own, and that's actually kind of a and one of those unwritten perks of traveling and being a, a traveling consultant, you get to you get the uh, you know the Hilton Honors uh, awards and the American Airlines points and all these things. Another strategy to remember is share it, it, look into those programs because you can often share your Hilton Honors number with your American Airlines people and your American Airlines number with your Hilton number. And every time you're, you're doing things together, you get twice as many points. It starts to add up very quickly. And and I know this because when I did travel for constantly for four years, um, I, I had unbelievable status with everybody and it's just, it all starts to couple upon one another. Um, I think it was Amy, yeah, Amy Rosillo talked about um, some, make sure you understand the policies and reimbursement with personal versus work travel. If you're gone more for, uh, for family or personal travel than um, for work, it may not be reimbursable, at least in the German government. So. That's fascinating stuff. Wow. Also, also with UN agencies. So you might say you look through their policies, but they're often in many places. So they'll actually have stipulations if you, because I feel like some people take advantage of your a day there and they have then you're going on your vacation. So uh, all, often they'll have a, a, a actual uh, limit. Like if it's 50% or more is personal, then all of a sudden, all your costs are not reimbursable. Mm. Not 50% are reimbursable, none are reimbursable. So it's just being cautious of that. And I would caution anybody that is combining things to keep as much segregated as possible. I literally will check out yeah. and have them issue a new invoice and mm. check in again, yep. you know, because it's my husband's name on there. It just looks not so good uh, for people, you know, and then other people feel a little bit resentment. They're like, oh, you were just on vacation with your, you know, with your family or something. So literally keep them, I mean, it's just my advice, keep them as segregated as possible. Absolutely. and. You know, uh, to add to that, um, 
when I went out on my own, uh, so left employment, um, I immediately got a separate business credit card um, so that I could really keep things separate. These are business expenses, they're going on the business card. These are personal expenses. And Amy, I've done the same thing. I have also uh, sometimes um, checked out of a hotel. And I mean, I set up the I set up the reservations so that I could stay in the same room, but I told them the first X number of nights are going on this credit card, and then the next nights are going on a different credit card and, and set it up that way, you know, so that for the same reason you mentioned. So thank you. Um, okay. Uh, exchange rates, I just wanted to mention um, that um, I found, gee, you know, I charge as many expenses as I can on my um, business credit card, um, first of all, because I get points, but also um, for international travel, everything's automatically converted to US dollars. And I, I'm going on the assumption that everybody on this call is based, I think you've all mentioned that you're based in the US. And so, um, Expenses are automatically converted to US dollars, so that's super easy. What I do for cash expenses is I identify an exchange rate from the day the expense was incurred and I document it. So I have here, there's an example of a, a site that I've used to do that. And um, my clients have found that to be acceptable. My accountant has found that to be acceptable. Um, so I go to that website, I put in the date, like, you know, the date I paid for a meal at a restaurant in cash because they didn't accept credit cards. And, you know, I put in the, the, the date and the currency and then I get a rate and then that's the rate I used for the, the cash exchange. So if anybody else has, a, has another strategy for that, um, would love to hear it. It's just sometimes you can't avoid using cash. At least I, sometimes I can't avoid using cash, even though I try not to. Um, Ways travel expenses can be covered by clients. So I wanted to mention a little bit about this. Um, the client can pay directly. Um, you know, they say, we're booking the hotel, we're booking the airline. Um, again, um, you can usually get your, your reward points information in there if you ask. Even if they don't ask you, ask them. Um, per diem, so Matt was referring to that. Um, our per diems cover their like daily rates for lodging, meals, and incidentals. And there are rates for the US for different cities. And there are also rates for different countries that um, the latter established by the US Department of State. Um, so um, some clients will, will uh, cover based on per diems. Um, some, there's, um, sometimes there's reimbursement of actual expenses. These bullet points are not meant to be, they're not mutually exclusive. I'm just mentioning different kinds of ways you can be reimbursed. So reimbursement of actual expenses is, hey, you know, here's what my hotel cost, here's what my train ticket cost, here's what this cost, and you're reimbursed. Um, I have one client that gives a flat amount. They say, we're tacking on an extra thousand dollars to this contract for travel expenses. Use it. However, if you can do it for cheap or great, if it costs you more, too bad for you. That's just how we're doing it. We're keeping it simple. You don't need to give us any receipts. We're just tacking on an extra thousand dollars. And then I already mentioned this and, um, and, and uh, um, excuse me for not remembering who in the group, uh, one of you already mentioned this about, um, you know, you may travel for multiple clients. And so sometimes I'll get agreement with the clients that they'll be splitting the expenses and we agree on how they're split. Any comments or questions? Um, when I was doing travel to Fairbanks, Alaska, and I was estimating that they actually don't use the GSA rates for Fairbanks. It has to go through the Department of Defense. They do their own oh. for DM rates, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I thought that was weird too, because it is still the United States, but GSA only does the, the lower 48. That's so odd because I actually looked at the map recently and I, they, they had Alaska and Hawaii like shown in the map um, well, I don't know what it was. on it the was GSA, there. but but maybe I, I didn't actually click to look at the rates. So maybe mm -hmm. they don't exist. That's interesting. And the other thing to consider with all of this is in many ways, we're talking about three different parties here. We're talking about your client who's reimbursing 
you or your company, but for me, I separate myself and my company because I'm an employee of my company. And so it's advantageous to me to, to charge my company an appropriate amount. So I give myself per diem and I try and stay within my per diem so that in many ways I'm, I get the better, the better end of the deal. It's appropriate. It's all a passes muster with everybody and the auditor wants to take a look at it. But it's another way for me to, you know, bring a little bit back more in um, out of the company in an appropriate way. So same thing with mileage and things like that. But per diem is a great way to go um, if you're cheap. <laughs> so you, can, you can bring a little bit more, more money back in from your company. Um, and that's what we're always, you know, we always want to find ways to do that appropriately about taxes. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Um, so just a couple more items. Um, just be aware that clients may not cover everything. So there are uh, clients who won't cover business or first class airfare or train travel at all. Um, there are those who will only cover them under certain circumstances outlined in their policy manuals. So, you know, for example, you're taking a red eye out of the country. For anybody who's a fan of the old Star Trek, it's kind of like a game of Fizbin. You know, if uh, like 10 different circumstances align, they'll cover business class travel, for example. Um, you know, travel delays, uh, alcoholic beverages. So some clients, it's written in their policy that they will not cover alcoholic beverages. Um, also, if you get parking tickets or speeding tickets or any of those violations, generally clients will, you know, they won't cover those. You're on your own for that. Um, expense tracking and reporting. So um, clients may have required forms. Uh, you can create, uh, also you can create your own templates, whether you do that in Excel uh, or some other program. Um, bookkeeping software like QuickBooks uh, can track your travel expenses, whether it's by client or the type of expense, whether it's reimbursed or not. So again, coordinate with your bookkeeper or your accountant about how the expenses uh, should be coded. Comments or questions? Um, that's, all that, that's all that I had. I, I'm, I, let me stop so I can actually see. I'm gonna stop, uh, I'm gonna end the show.